Welcome back to Questing Beast. I'm Ben. Today we are looking at Planar Compass number two. This is an ongoing zine for Old School Essentials. This one is titled Buccaneers of the Big Black. So the idea here is that this is a planescape-like setting in the sense that it focuses on traveling to different planes of the multiverse. But rather than being in one city like uh, Sigil, Sigil, however you say that, uh, it focuses on sailing the astral sea. In this uh, case, you are actually going to be getting a ship and traveling across the astral, astral sea to different locations, different dimensions, having adventures, and so on. Uh, issue number one focused on one particular location, this sort of island port that could be your base of operations. You can see my review of that that I've done previously by checking out on my channel. Uh, this one, we're going to actually get into the more sailing aspects of this particular setting. On the back here, it says, why do you seek adventure? Is it for riches, fame, or the thrill? All this and more can be found on the astral sea. But what weird dangers lurk below the psychic waters? Are the rewards truly worth the risk? So this requires uh, the first issue to really flesh out some of the mechanics, as well as old school essentials. Although, of course, using a standard basic expert D&D or any other BX derivative system is going to work just fine. Before we check out the insides though, quick shout out to today's sponsor. This episode is sponsored by Planar Compass Issue 3, Time Priests of Ordo, a brand new zine to navigate the multiverse of old school adventures. Discover Ordo, the plane of law and time, home of the Chanakoids, automaton folk whose time priests were the first to harness the power of divine chronology. It features secrets and lore of a tightly wound society, two new classes, the time priest and the Chanakoid, divine law and time spells, monsters and creatures to ruin your day and enrich your journey, as well as plenty of adventure seeds. Check it out on Kickstarter using the link below. All right, let's see what we get inside Planar Compass. Right inside the front cover here is the Multiverse in Brief, where you get a rundown of all the different planes of existence within this particular version of the D&D Multiverse, though you could easily substitute in more official versions if you wanted to. Uh, descriptions of the planes, for example, elemental, an elemental fire is realm of lava, flame, and incineration, or Ordo is a plane of law and time, uh, Sunix is a plane of light and truth, etc. The inhabitants that are there, known, known portals that allow you to access that particular plane, and the distance from Dreamhaven, which is that central island uh, hub of operations from issue one. So you can simply set out from Dream Dreamhaven, sail across the Astral Sea, and try and reach one of these planes, or I guess you could try and actually find one of the portals. Our introduction lets us know that there are some required books, like we mentioned before, some optional books. You can get the advanced fantasy um, books from OSE, though that you don't really need those. Mid-level play, this is really focused on levels four and up, um, although, as usual, lower level characters could tackle it. They're just going to have a much harder time. Uh, we have uh, how to keep time here. Everything is mostly bound to central ordo time. So that the plane of law and time is the plane that everyone counts days by, which I think is kind of fun. Days are called apertures, and those are broken down into sects, which I guess are like hours, though it's not completely clear here. First of all, we have a section on monsters that you can encounter while sailing these astral seas. Bubonic barnacles, which start off as crawler vines that your ship could perhaps sail through that are floating in the astral sea. And these very quickly evolve into stragglers, which is like a humanoid figure made out of seaweed, and then into an algae bloom, which can uh, cause a lot more damage. So if you spend a long time fighting these guys, they get worse and worse and worse. There's also dragons you can encounter, like the astral amphi amphiptyr. Hopefully I'm saying that right. And their breath is not fire or ice. They actually breathe a planal tear in the universe, which is really fun effect to have. What other monsters we have in here? Fool's Fire with like lots of like these little firefly fairy things that can attack you. A glass giant which shatters into shards, dealing damage when you destroy it. Or a hypnotal, hypnolotl, which is a kind of large salamander dude that can hypnotize you. Some especially nasty guys here like the Lobknot, which is a combination of a giant shark and a crab-like thing. This one has 15 hit dice and can really dish out the damage. It has a confusing glare and it has anti-magic cones that actually prevent you from casting spells while its eyes are looking at you, kind of like a beholder. This one's a lot of fun too. Oliver's Bane, a crackling, creaking pile of bones. Um, and it has lots of different skulls that it has added to its pile and is trying to grab you and add you to its collection as well. Is a chattering crawl, the mass makes a dragging, clacking, and clinking noises as it shambles and rolls around. 
If the mass is within five feet of anything recently dead, it will tear pieces from it to add to itself. Each skull it acquires adds one to its hit die. If it gets too many hit dice, it starts splitting into smaller little bone piles. Overall, I really like the design and layout of this book. It does remind me a lot of old school essentials. Uh, it's very clear, very easy to read. The stat blocks are done in red, which is a nice touch, it makes them uh, stand out even more. So you can quickly find the stats that you're looking for. Any special abilities have you know, bolding, so you can really easily grab what it can do. And you can easily, easily scan them and pick up the important information right off the bat. Uh, some of the most important monsters are coming up next, or the most important one, the Kier. And it starts off with this little uh, comic book of players encountering this Leviathan type of beast that can swallow entire ships. I like little comic books like this because it gives you a sense of what it would be like to explore that particular setting. Now, the Kier can actually stalk your ship and uh, crush it or swallow it whole. We'll get more into that later on. But it can also be a threat just on a personal level because it can spit out all of these larvae that can grab onto you, start chewing you up, and possibly kill you and take over your body and puppet you around. Uh, so that's a type of zombie, I suppose, a villain that you could use to threaten your players. Lots of different pirate encounters, of course, while you're sailing the astral seas. Notable features, for example, they're uh, smuggling psychic dugongs, or they're the luckiest crew alive. You got some ship names here, like the Gift of the Sea, the Zephyr's Boast, or the Eden's Bow, and the crew composition, like maybe they are all Belisoriso. I think that's a race that was introduced previously. Uh, maybe they're all human. Maybe they're cosmopolitan. All planes, worlds, colors, and creeds represented. Our next section is for astral ships. And what I like about this is that it really makes use of the seafaring rules from BX or from old school essentials. And those rules are very rarely used. Most people don't do seafaring adventures. So they're just kind of in the book. No one really uses them. But here it says refer to those rules. We're going to be using them. There's saving throws here, which I like saving throws, especially for ships. So this, the saving throws are for storms, collisions, fire, water, and plane shifts. There's also a number of different special uh, ship weapons like a ballista or fire throwers that you can use to really mess up your opponent's day. We get a whole bunch of different ship types. Uh, some of them come with illustrations. We have four illustrations up here for these main ones. And they have like their cost in coins, their max cargo in coins, things like the rowing miles per aperture, that means per day, um, because you can calculate how far you can go when traveling to those destinations that we saw earlier on in the book. They have stuff like the number of mercenaries they can hold, their armor class, their hull points, their saving throws, and whether you can add rams, catapults, ballistas, and fire throwers. More ships here, and even more over here. We got the Tortuga, a large armored warship first made by humans. It has a protective shell-like covering over the deck and two masts. You also get a psionic ship. If you're, I guess, a powerful enough psychic, you can summon a ship that you are projecting with your own mind that you can sail around. The downside, of course, is that if you ever fall asleep or are knocked unconscious, then the ship straight up disappears. Here's a number of magic items for you to find, like an Orden timepiece. It's like a clock or a watch set to the plane of time, so you always know what time it is. Or the sort of astral tether cutting. If you find someone who is journeying on the astral plane by projecting themselves there, you can sever their connection to their home plane and kill them instantly. Our next section is a explanation of how hex flowers work, because this zine uh, uses that pretty prominently in a number of different ways. And it allows you to track a number of different things at the same time by using a um, physical map layout. But this isn't, isn't an actual map. It's more like a diagram that you move around using certain rules. So this is for travel and encounters. You start here and you're trying to figure out uh, what's happening as you're traveling. The amount of hexes that you're going to have to move through depends on how far away that location is. And like I said, there's that uh, chart at the beginning of the book for that. Um, however, if you manage to reach the top of the map, then you get to your location earlier. In the meantime, each of these hexes that you land on are going to give you a, you know, a, a place that you find or an encounter or things like that. Basically, you're going to start at the start point right here and roll 2d6. The result of the 2d6 tells you what direction you are going to uh, move in. So if you rolled a two or a three, you'd move up to here. And that is a small icon of a ship. So a vessel sighted. If it's a small icon, then it's farther away and it's more unlikely that you might encounter it. If it's really big, then it's like right on top of you and you have to deal with it. That's a nice visual way to represent that information. If you go off the map, you loop back around. So if you were here and you went off in this direction, you would come back here. And if you went off in this direction, you would come back over here. 
There's also a hex flower for tracking the weather where you start down here and you move around it, rolling on this every time you um, go another day of travel. The images here tell you what kind of weather it's like and the number of dots tell you how strong the wind is, which can increase or decrease your movement speed trying to get to your destination. If you get all the way to the top of the map, you get stuck in this storm. Notice that there's X's on these three sides, which means you cannot, um, if you roll any of these numbers, you actually cannot move off the map in that direction, meaning that you're gonna be probably stuck there for maybe more than one day. We also have this hex flower tracking nearby planes so that as you are traveling around the astral sea, you're gonna find yourself closer to or further away from different elemental planes, which is gonna theme the kinds of encounters that you have if you have any. And we have a rundown of the different planes and how they can affect the encounters you have over here. So we have the astral sea, for example, or elemental air. So this is like a potentially benign encounters or dangerous encounters, which could be rolled on the encounter chart. You would use this if you were near the plane of air. And then you have one for earth, one for fire, one for water, Mors, the plane of death, Ordo, the plane of time and law, uh, the plane of life, the plane of light and truth, and the plane of darkness and lies. Frankly, keeping track of everything on all of these hex flowers seems like a bit much, especially if you're just doing it in the book. Um, I think if I was running this, what I would do is print out those pages and have them openly visible on the table in front of all the players. That does give them a lot of information, but I think that's kind of a good thing. So they can anticipate a little bit what could be coming up next. And that gives them a little bit of room to prepare and it allows everyone to participate in tracking what's going on on these hex flowers. Now, as you're traveling around, the giant monster, the huge Leviathan is also tracking you. At a certain point, it can rise up and begin hunting you down. Um, it's gonna roll on the hex flowers just like you are, but it can also try and nudge itself and moving in slightly off from the rolled direction in order to try and get closer to you. Now, it should be pointed out that player characters or the, the party can also do this. They can get these navigation points, which allow them to fudge their rolls slightly so they have a little bit more control over what kinds of encounters they have and to probably try and move away from the monster as well. But what happens if you actually run into this beast and it swallows you? Is the game over? No, indeed. You get to actually get a, a dungeon inside of its belly which is a theme that we've seen show up more than once in the OSR, especially in uh, Genial Jack, the giant god whale setting that I've reviewed previously. But we have yet another hex flower. So we start um, down right in the middle, I believe, and you're rolling on this to move around inside of the beast. You have these different zones here that are gonna make things more or less dangerous depending on where you are. One possible goal is to make it all the way up to the cranium and kill the brain and therefore kill the monster or just find a orifice and get out that way. We have a whole bunch of different room descriptions you can roll on randomly as you travel around. It is a little odd that there's 18 of them since you are rolling a D20. In some of the locations you're rolling a D20 and taking the highest. So I'm not sure why 19 and 20 are missing. I feel like I'm missing something here, but uh, yeah, I don't really know what's going on with that. Now there's a number of optional tables here if you want even more flavor for the locations like the cavity shape, traps that might be there, NPCs, if you talk to them, you can get navigation points to help, like I said, um, shift your direction to help you navigate inside the monster. And there's lots of flavor here. What does it say on the side? Notable features where you can roll on this uh, table and then over this way with a D8 to get things like the temperature, the smell and the taste, things, noises, surfaces, air currents, psychic things that are going on and what the light is like. Near the back of the book, we have a number of adventure hooks that you can use to pull the players into the Astral Sea and get them sailing. And then we have the open game license, similar to what we see in Old School Essentials, some uh, section for notes here. And then at the very back, like, as like a little bonus feature, Astral Fishing. Basically, you'll just roll a d20. You can uh, add plus one or plus two if you got some bait. And hopefully you get a random fish. Um, if you roll a 13 to 14, then a fish bites, but there's a monster chasing it and you have to deal with that. The, the fish could range anywhere from sea urchins that could be used as caltrops to a talking tuna that's super chatty, all the way up to a golden fish. When it sings, a pound of gold pieces rain from the sky. It escapes while the gold distracts the party. And that's it for Planar Compass issue number two. As usual, I will put links in the description below and down in the comments for where you can pick this up for yourself. Uh, it seems like a really useful book if you want to get your players into sailing the high seas, 
but they don't want to do it in the mortal realms. They want something a little bit more exciting, get them sailing across the astral sea and through a lot of weird encounters their way. A great way to open up the multiverse for your players if you want to start getting them traveling to different dimensions. And it has that um, board gamey like feel by using those hex flowers where they can see all the different possibilities laid out in front of them and try and manipulate them to get to where they're going. They'll probably feel a little bit more like actual sailors as they try and navigate these hex maps. All right, that's it for today, everyone. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.